Welcome to Exhibition. And hello, Carolyn Zielinski. Hi, Richard. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Oh, great to see you there. Uh, and your exhibition is Barren Land at Nanda Hobbs in Sydney. Um, and most of the images uh, in this particular body of work seem to stem from outback or country Australia, country towns, outback landscapes and figures and mythology to some extent. Give us an idea of where the impetus for that collection of works came from. So the, this body of work was created in response to the Evelyn Chapman Award, which um, is a scholarship that I was awarded in 2020, where I proposed to take a trip uh, to follow a journey that Russell Drysdale had taken in 1944, um, recording drought conditions with Keith Nauman uh, for the Sydney Morning Herald. And it really is like outside of my usual over, so to speak. And it's very specifically landscapes, which were proposed for the Evelyn Chapman Award, which is run by the National Trust and it's, uh, yeah, I'm not a landscape painter. So um, I really threw myself in the deep end with this. And yeah, it's been, it's been quite a journey the last two years. So in many ways, this is almost like a, a visual diary of some of the, the places, uh, the situations and the people that you encountered. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's very much, um, I think I found it very difficult to relinquish the people from the paintings and um, yeah I ended up so like a lot of the paintings are of the people I met um, and in combination with the places I went. Let's come back to the the exhibition images again and the exhibition theme uh, in a moment or two um, but first of all people may know you best for your portraits, uh, because right at the moment, you are in the current Archibald Prize. Uh, you are recently announced as a finalist in the Darling Portrait Prize uh, at the, the, uh, the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and a while back, you won the Portia Gitch uh, Award for Portraiture. So can you take us through in particular, uh, the Archibald and the, the Darling Portrait Prizes. Tell us, tell us uh, a little bit about them. Uh, well, for the Archibald Prize, I painted Mitch and Mark, who were the winners of the 2020 series of The Block. Yeah, I had, I, I had no idea um, what to expect, but I went to Newport to their Home, home design store and uh, sketched them in front of all these people. So there was um, all bands and people like walking in and out. And normally it's, you know, my, it's very private, the sitting, you know, like you sit <laughs> just one on one. And it took me like a month to paint the painting and like 11 hours a day. And then uh, my roof caved in with all the rain. And like, I thought that's it, it's done for the painting. and you know, managed to fix it. And um, yeah, and as soon as I put down the brush, I like went into immediate depression because I was like, it's never going to get in. Oh, well, like there goes like a month of my life. Um, and uh, yeah, and I got in, like who would have thought? So how do you approach the way in which you portray somebody when you're painting them? Uh, the, the, the darling portrait, finalist uh, is a portrait of uh, John Feitelson, the publisher of Artist Profile, um, and the portrait which won the Portia Geach Award is uh, of contemporary dancer Anthea Pilko. But neither of these are glamorous portraits. Um, they're poignant in, in many ways. So, so what are you looking for and how do you approach it? Well, my, my sentiment is that, uh, you know, uh, glamour and beauty are for 
magazines and television and Instagram and, you know, uh, and, um, yeah, so I, that's, I, I dispense with that immediately. Like, I feel like I have to lean towards almost abstraction in order to encompass the personality of the person. The carpet, I always try to make lean towards a person's personality. So it's like, how, how would you express in a pattern a person's personality? So with his, it's like the menorah and uh, then it's like all intertwined with gardens and yeah. So it's like trying to capture that like flourishing garden of all these you know, ideas that he has and um, which is like the, I think his imagination is the bedrock of, you know, his personality. Yeah, it's, uh, and so the same with um, Anthea. Anthea was, is a contemporary dancer and um, I met her, like I don't, I really don't leave this space that you see, I mean like 11 hours a day and then I go to sleep, but I do, leave the house at about five in the morning. That's my social interaction where I'd go completely insane. And I do go and have a coffee at the coffee shop around the corner. And half the people I've actually painted I've met at this coffee shop. So Anthea was this lady I met there and um, you know, she'd order a coffee every morning. Yeah, she had this, always wore this big fur coat and added our slides and uh, yeah, she was very inter like I just found her very interesting and I asked to paint her and um So what do you hope to capture in a portrait uh when somebody sits down in front of you? I I guess I hope to capture my my experience of that person. So and and uh and that it not only speaks to that person that it's been painted but to it, there's a like there's a shared humanity in it I want to resonate with who I paint as well and you know like they say that uh, any portrait you paint is like a self-portrait at the end of the day yeah I think you know you rub away like all the all the nuances of people and there is a shared humanity and I guess there's like that duality of capturing the individual and the shared humanity. So going back now to the works in your exhibition, clearly you encountered quite a number of individuals and groups of individuals in these, on your, uh, on your country travels. How did you relate to them and how did you hope to capture them in these works? Well, I, I felt completely out of my element because I, I live in the CBD there's buildings there's only so far like your eye can see and when you go out there it's like the landscape is unending and um I was really thrown out of my comfort zone at the same time I was very excited to go out there like I was, you know like I feel like you know we're, Australia is such a strange and unique land and you really like it's such an integral part of being in this country, like uh, uh, to experience the outback. Like I said, I researched uh, the exact trip that Russell Drysdale took and I ended up driving out there. I drove out there twice, so I drove out there once and I went to Mungo and uh, like via Wagga and the Hay Plains. And um, then I drove, and then I drove with my dad and his friend um, to, through Cobar, uh, Wilcannia, uh, to Broken Hill and then Tibaburra. And um, it was just completely open. I had a sketch pad and I had my camera. I got to Broken Hill because this lady I knew um, picked me up and um, she picked me up at four. She was up early all the time. So she'd pick me up at four in the morning and drive me out to... She drove me to Silverton and she posed for me in Silverton as the sun was rising. That's the painting, um, Words of Silverton. I was very aware of being an outsider in this environment. So, you know, I didn't want to come in and like, you know, cast some aspersion. I really wanted to uh, reflect what I saw 
uh, as neutrally as possible. You seem to be able to capture both a sense of some of the individuals that you encountered, but also a sense of, of the bigness of the land, but perhaps a sense of the isolation that those individuals face as well. You know, you go, you go out there and it's flat, like it's, um, there's rubble, there's stones. And it's like, well, how do you capture that vastness like, and have something in the painting? You know, like it's, uh, I'm not an abstract painter, but it, so I can't just, you know, do a colour field painting. Um, and it wasn't actually till the very end of this series that I, something clicked and I was able to go, okay, this is how I'm gonna. This is how I'm gonna approach the the empty, vast emptiness of the of the landscape. And um, I think what I began with was, uh, yeah, much more um, like concentrating on the people I met and how how they fit into this landscape. Because it's like you go out there, and it's like the thing that occurs to me the most when I'm out there is like, you know what made people come here? Like in, you know, like the 1700s, what drove them to like, you know, just keep traversing through these empty landscapes? On the same token, you have these like colonial land, like colonial, you know, colonially built little towns. And then you have like the indigenous people who you feel do belong to that landscape displaced in these like unnatural, you know, like colonially built landscapes. And it's almost like everyone out there is, is not where they're meant to be or displaced. And um, I, you know, it's just how to, but people, you know, like you know, it's testament to the human spirit. People build these lives in, you know, like the remote, the most remote stretches of, you know, the land, how much did you have a sense of connection with those First Nations people and their much longer history with the land? I think that permeates through the land. I think it's like it, it, it absolutely linked. And, like, um, and, you know, I think especially the more remote places you go, the more of a sense of, you know, uh, I, I, I am a visitor in this landscape. And um, in the town of Broken Hill, I actually met um, a lady, Rosie B, who um, uh, we just started talking and, um, cause I live in Woolloomooloo and there's a large indigenous population in Woolloomooloo. And we actually knew a lot of the same people, but uh, yeah, and, and Rosie B is actually, this lady who I painted and um, I tried in this painting to capture that displacement. Like the only, the only sign of nature is the shadows. So uh, of um, a ghost gum, but otherwise it's like it, this built up area. And, you know, it's like this, this uh, removal from, from the land and I didn't want it to be bereft of all hope. So there is one on one of the, tree on, on one of the bus stop um, legs, there's like one blade of grass, which is like poking through, which is, you know, like there's hope for humanity yet. You do seem very much in many of these works to notice the really small details of the environment. Uh, sometimes there are even references to names of, of products or businesses in very small detail. How important is that that detail of both the built and the natural and the community landscape to you? I think you take for granted certain things in your own environment, but when you're out of that environment, you notice like little little details that nuance that area. And um, so they're all based on actual events. So you might be referring to like the forex in the pub or the cricket painting. Um, so we went to a mother in Tibaburra, we went to a Mother's Day cricket match, which was between White Cliffs and Tibaburra, and it was to raise awareness for mental health and it was sponsored by Forex. 
you have mentioned that you are not a landscape painter, but you have created some very beautiful and some very evocative uh, images of the landscape. What's your assessment of your, your ability to capture landscape now? I, I'm, I'm content with what I've made. Uh, I feel like it was an absolute hurdle and struggle and uh, um, but I think as a body of work I feel like it represents my experience of um, the land and the people I met and I particularly wanted to do justice to the people I met because they're actually incredible people so um, and I'm still in contact with a lot of them. Some of the characters uh, from your travels, which obviously you met and, and encountered, uh, sometimes are in sizable groups, like Saturday night at the, at the pub and so on. How do you go about creating and capturing the dynamics of groups of people with the type of works that you create? Well, that, that particular painting, so we had... Um, just come back from the cricket my Mother's Day cricket match that day, and uh, we were staying in the family hotel, which used to be owned by Clifton Pugh in the 1970s, and actually has murals from floor to ceiling by Clifton Pugh and Rick and Moore and Russell Drysdale. And Chibabara had won the cricket match, and all the uh, sheep shearing stations had had their last day of shearing. So it was just like this all these people at this pub, like all getting drunk and like celebrating and all the merriment. And um, it, the way that painting actually came about was so, I, it was this like whirlwind of a trip. We were, like it was like there and back and like all crazy. And when I got home, the first day I got back to Sydney, I was actually, lying in my bed with all like the images of all the things I'd experienced, like, you know, dancing around my head. And um, I actually woke up and like drew, drew that out, like um, drew, uh, just kind of drew all the different characters and everything. Cause they were all, you know, like dancing so vividly in my head. And that's, that's how that, uh, the composition of that painting actually came about and on the, left-hand corner of the painting, there's um, Clifton Pugh and Russell Drysdale are like looking over at all the merriment going on. And uh, the lady in the center who really ran the show um, were, and it was, is the publican, Melissa um, Thompson and her husband who owned the pub. So they're all in there and I'm in the background. Yeah, that's how that image came about. Can we have a look at some of the approaches that you use uh, in your works? Uh, because the strength of line, the use of line is, is very powerful in um, all of your paintings. Uh, and yet there is also a very strong painted quality to them as well. But first of all, tell us why, why the line is such an important chosen element. Yeah, I, like my perspective is that like I'm completely anally retentive and a control freak and cannot relinquish any type of control. And so everything has to be like, you know, embedded in this like order. And I like, I often look at like, you know, like more abstract and free painters. And I think like, oh, it'd be so remarkable to just like, you know, splash paint at will and allow it to move and, you know, allow it to make its mark. But like, it's a bit like my life, every detail has to be like, uh, premeditated and controlled. How did that line work evolve? Uh, is it something, ha have you always drawn? Has that been a predominant part of your practice? And, and is that why it's such a, a strong part of your works? It's just uh, like, it's always been present. And it's, I feel like it, like, I don't think it was ever a conscious decision, but when I look back on like earlier works, it was definitely there as well. So I think it's just uh, perhaps become more pronounced. But I really like the idea of, uh, you know, like I feel like a painting almost like, you know, like fights to come into existence. And, you know, like it's like that line is like etched into the canvas and it's like the, the 
the work sort of fights for its own existence and you know I think mimics a bit of life as well like I think every person has to etch out their own existence in some way. And the paint plays a critical role but it's it seems a much more subtle role as there are shifts in in tones and shades in the paint. Again, how did that approach come to develop? Uh, I, I don't know that it's, uh, I don't know that it's a particularly conscious development. I think it's like for each image, it's, uh, you know, a play on the, the colours that are present because most of the, most of my work is based from a sitting or some kind of reality, um, <laughs> abstract as that reality may be. But so, yeah, so it's, it's, um, it's my version of like, you know, uh, putting in shading and, you know, like painting, painting what I see, I guess, yeah. Are there strong influences over the years or over your uh, practice that have, have brought you to the painting and representational style that you've now chosen? What motivated my work a lot was uh, that idea of like being a, like docu photo photography as documentation. And I think it, I have taken that approach with my painting, except for this series, which was like a complete launch into just painting for the sake of painting, completely removed from politics. So it's been quite a journey for me as well. But uh, a lot of like my work is actually like uh, based in um, some kind of social commentary, uh, which I was very conscious of letting go of in this series. I did not want to be making social commentary. Uh, I just wanted it to be experiential. Well, you've certainly taken us on that journey with you today. So, Caroline Zielinski, thanks very much for sharing your exhibition with us. Thank you very much, Richard. I've had a lot of fun. <laughs>